welcome to Queer Conversation. Today I have uh, in the studio with me Linda Parker from the South Australian University. Glad to be here. Linda, we are talking about a survey that you've been involved with or you headed um, in South Australia, bullying LGBTQI um, students and the reactions of teachers. Yes. So can you tell us a bit about the, the survey to start off with? Yeah, absolutely. So even though we're both, our, our team's based here in South Australia at the University of South Australia or UniSA, we actually conducted a survey Australia-wide and we had a really great sample. And what I mean by that is that we had teachers from government schools, private schools, religious schools, private not religious schools. We had even included student teachers. So we had a really solid sample and were able to capture quite a broad array of the population that we were interested in. And what we wanted to know was what was informing teachers' intentions to intervene when they saw the bullying and harassment of LGBTQIA plus students. Now, the reason this question was so important to myself and the rest of the research team was because of two really key reports where young people in Australia continued to report that they felt incredibly socially isolated at school when it came to the, their bullying and harassment. They were even reporting that teachers, um, in some instance, instances, were participating in bullying and harassment, which is, was shocking news. But each iteration of these reports, there seemed to be so little change, despite, you know, what appears to be um, positive societal change towards sexual and gender minorities in the community. So I wanted, I wanted to know what was going on there. And we looked at the literature and it was really quite shocking because Australia has so little literature on this topic. And what we are able to refer to is mostly international literature. And it's not really possible to generalise findings from another culture, another society here in Australia. Like we have similarities, but you would of course expect there to be differences. So we felt that it was very important to, to start to determine what was going on here. And it was really quite surprising because the results showed us that although teachers often report elsewhere that lack of knowledge around LGBTQIA plus issues and other barriers such as not clear policy or unsupportive leadership impacts their ability to advocate for the, these kids. Um, what we actually found was those those things weren't significant in the in our um, analysis. What actually was significant, the most significant, was their attitudes towards transgender or gender diverse young people. And their attitudes in or beliefs in general towards gender and social norms around gender, which was quite quite shocking to find out that teachers' professional practices were informed by these attitudes. But when we took a step back, of course they are. Of course, unconscious bias informs teachers just the same as it does anybody else in the population. But it's really what we do with that information now which will be the interesting and exciting part of this next leg of the journey where we try to work with teachers to help them identify, identify the influences of those factors on their professional practices. But we also want very much to work with LGBTQIA plus young people and say, this is the question of the next part of the research. What is support, or What does support look like to you when you are bullied and harassed? Because we don't just want to assume that it's the same as it is for young people who are bullied more generally, because it's not. It's informed by homophobia, transphobia, heteronormativity, hegemony, all those influences which a general bullying response simply won't capture. So this is what we want to drill into here. And we really want to elevate the voices of young people in this next part of the, our research and really identify what's going to be helpful to you. What do teachers need to do to support you as you're navigating these sometimes, often even, hostile school environments? 
we know when it comes to teachers that, as you would ex- probably expect, that teachers do have a strong sense of social justice and they, they do want to support LGBTQIA plus young people to be successful, to have a positive schooling experience. But we also know that um, things such as curriculum demands, you know, often get in the way reportedly of teachers' ability to intervene effectively. You know, so what we really want to do is support teachers um, to ensure that they, A, have the resources, like, and resources is quite broad in terms of knowledge, obviously, is important. Um, Knowledge of policy, you'd be surprised at how many um, people working in the field don't necessarily understand um, the importance of the bullying and harassment policies that pertain to LGBTQI plus communities. So those sorts of resources. Um, it's also important to understand um, that teachers' colleagues are a resource as well. So you can imagine that when your colleagues are reportedly more affirming, that people are almost experience positive peer pressure. You know, they have such strong role modelling going on behind, around them and their ecosystem that they um, feel more equipped to respond according to what policy and processes, you know, uh, are in place at that particular school. We obviously know that um, young people who are attending schools where perhaps they're not going to have such a strong representation of um, LGBTQIA plus issues in general, or perhaps these are religious schools and they have um, certain they've taken a certain stance on these issues that teachers may not feel confident, or in some instances may feel that they're risking their employment, or potentially uh, exposing themselves to conflict with with parents even, or or their colleagues or leadership. One of the major findings was about unconscious bias, which is a mm. obviously a big word in the corporate world. I don't think I've ever heard or seen anything like this in within the school system. Oh, I'm so excited to hear you say that because, um, yeah, that's my observation as well. Like we see, like, and some of my colleagues are working in the US and elsewhere and there is often such a stronger emphasis on things such as unconscious bias training uh, so that, again, people aren't being punished for what we know is a very human um, characteristic, but they are given the tools to understand the influences of these processes and start to deconstruct their own Um, responses and actions so that they align with their values because often people are very much invested in being good people and being fair and kind and inclusive but if they don't have the tools to understand unconscious bias and how it weaves their weaves its influence in their lives in their perspectives then they really are handicapped from the very beginning and so yes I, I think there is such avoid at the moment in the education sector generally on that topic of unconscious bias and we could do a lot more in that space and I I suspect that um, you know resourcing the the education sector in that way will yield really positive results for the community that we're we're advocating so hard for here and I you know I I speak to young people all the time um, and they're just yearning for understanding yearning for validation on these issues they are really many times uh, it's heartbreaking to hear how much they are suffering it's, it's actually fascinating to think about this particular topic of bullying or an un- inappropriate language etc towards lgbtqi plus students but if you are able to tackle the 
idea of, um, of unconscious bias training and support in the education system, you would not only tackle issues of bullying for LGBTQI+, but issues of, you know, picking on, on minorities, um, would it be religious yes, or yes. cultural? Yes. Um, it's not so much just an LGBT issue then. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I fully endorse what you're saying and I, I couldn't agree any further on that issue. Like, I think raising the emotional intelligence is kind of what we're talking about here of our society so that we are able to build relationships and build communities which are safe spaces for everybody not just for them for the majority is so important it's got to be our most critical work in this time and i'm sure it will be because you know if the corporates embrace it um, uh, there is no reason why the education system wouldn't embrace it. Well, I, I, I again, I agree, Silka. Like, um, obviously, the corporate world probably they have, you know, everybody's motivations are, are, are you know, broad, but they, they are very smart in understanding the landscape in which they work. And I really hope that we start to see some of that. Um, pragmatics at least and have you seen okay. have you seen that quite of respond overseas that you've seen an example a role model so to speak in other schools around the world i think what we're seeing what what comes to my mind at the moment is just how like in schools a lot of it, it's very difficult because for instance i want to refer to the us but the us is such a it's a, it's a big locale for a starters and it can be very quite diverse in its approach. But when we see it done well, we see these issues on, in terms of inclusivity and unconscious bias um, incorporated into the, the school environment and where it's become, it's, it's very much on the agenda of the school leadership to make unconscious bias inclusivity issues a shared understanding a shared body of knowledge so they may approach it in different ways Silka but what their agenda seems to be is by is to create an environment where everybody understands that everybody has a right to be there and that we all can be different but exist with each other in a climate that is holistic, um, built upon values and principles that, that you know, that are human, humanistic at the end of the day. Um, but I think I would be reaching to say that there's what this particular school is doing exceptionally well. I think it's it comes down to components almost. And you'll see what, like, we've done these big, there's a big meta-analysis that I looked at recently, and they compared these bullying and harassment programs against other bullying and harassment programs. And, but, but they compared it component by component. And you had these bigger programs, which had all these, like, many different components added into it. They weren't any more successful than a single program that maybe just had one component that might have been around, um, diversity and inclusivity or um, you know whatnot which was encouraging to know because these programs are often very very expensive and they're very time consuming to roll out but schools or education uh, the education sector generally can look at this sort of information and go we know that for lgbtqia plus young people that this particular component works really well and it could be around education for teachers on how to intervene bullying and harassment, how to recognize it, you know, how to respond to it. We can, we don't need a bullying and harassment expensive wheelie program to address this. We just need to add this into what we're already doing and we need to nail it and do it really, really well. You know, so that's exciting. You cannot ever do enough about this topic because Bullying affects so many kids these days in in, a, in in such a terrible way. But now we actually have the tools yeah, to do exactly. something about it because we are aware of it. It's a journey. Exactly. And what I find really encouraging as well is that we can no longer, I don't think, I, I, don't, I think even the most hardened critic can no longer say that this is an individual issue any longer. We know that 
LGBTQIA plus young people are more prone to developing a, a whole range of um, adverse mental health issues. And we know that it's associated with those, those hostile environments that they're, they're constantly exposed to. Um, we, I don't think anybody can any longer say that this is an, just an issue with the LGBTQIA plus community. You know, to so you mentioned before that you are planning another survey on this topic. Yeah, yeah. So what we want to do now is we want to, we're in the planning stages at the moment, but we want to work, uh, I want to run some focus groups with um, some pride clubs in secondary schools here in South Australia. And I want to get their their insight, their feedback on this issue and ask them, you know, very clear questions about in this situation, what's most meaningful to you that you need from a teacher? Because we have all the reports where, you know, their young people are reporting that teachers just are sometimes ignoring, sometimes participating, that they at the very best, broadly described as pretty ineffective. But when they do get it right, when teachers are responding and they are affirming, you know, young 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 people are reporting that it's incredibly beneficial and they stay more engaged at school and a whole range of other positive things. So we know that this is a, a, a fundamental key to driving change. But it's important that we co-design this next part with young people and interviews with teachers to really drill into, you know, what what's stopping teachers. This is what, and closing, and, you know, really addressing and exploring the gap between what teachers do and what LGBTQIA plus young people need. Exploring that gap and then developing a training in response to that. And then hopefully we'll, you know, run some you know, stats and see if there's any, you know, change in teachers' attitudes or beliefs or in affirming beliefs and behaviours towards this group of young people after participating in the training. And, and, you know, all goes well, it'll be positive and a success and we can build on that from there. We could not have done a survey like this and research like this 10, 15 years ago because there weren't many pride groups up at school. So we do have them now. We have the audience and um, good on you for, um, you know, looking at this topic and oh, moving you. the discussion along in the educational system. Oh, thank you. It's, it's a deep, it's actually a, a real honor. It's an honor for me. It, it's my why, <laughs> you know, I, I, don't, you know, I think, you know, this kind of work is takes a lot out of you, but I definitely couldn't do it if I wasn't deeply attached to the issue, you know, and I have um, close relationships with a lot of young people in the community and I see every day what they're going through. So it's not, something I take lightly and it's not something I'll be walking away from anytime Great. Thank soon. you, Linda, for joining us at Queer Conversation today. I we'll wish you all the best with the next okay. survey and uh, make sure to stay in touch. And if you like to hear more Queer Conversation, make sure to follow us on Lottel Media. And you can also head to our website, lotl.com, where you will find 30 years of history of LOTL magazine. My name is Silke Bader and thank you for your company. Mm -hmm.